The Edmonton City Center Green Party are holding their monthly executive meeting. The venue is the workshop room situated on the main floor of the Allard Hall at McEwen University. Start time is 10.30. On March the 3rd here in Edmonton, Green Party of Canada leadership candidate Alex Tyrell will be continuing his Green New Deal tour in our city. The venue is the Remedy Cafe, the one situated at 109th Street. Start time is 6 p.m. Uh, Alex Tyrell continues his GBC leadership tour the following day on March 4th in Calgary. The venue is the Village Square Library. Start time, 7 p.m. If you haven't had enough of our Green Party leadership uh, candidates, Green Party of Alberta leadership uh, candidates after today, you can join us in Calgary on March the 15th at the Inglewood Community Hall for debate number two. Start time is 2 p.m. And finally, members of the Green Party of Alberta will convene to elect a new leader on Saturday, March 28th in Red Deer for what promises to be an absolutely invigorating and exciting convention. Many details will be released in the coming weeks, but we look forward to seeing you there as well. And uh, Cass will be reminding you of a couple of these events uh, a little later on. So I also, in the spirit of housekeeping, I also want to mention that we have uh, some retro Green Party of Alberta t-shirts at the table, along with a donation jar, uh, please give generously. Uh, and at this time, I would like to simply point out that the leadership race, this leadership race, is the first part of a two-part process to implement a co-leader format that was adopted by members at the 2019 Green Party of Alberta Convention in Red Deer. And next on the agenda, without any further ado, I'd like to bring on the two candidates. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not be giving detailed introductions. Uh, once they have joined me at the front of the room, I'll explain the format. So, accordingly, please give a warm welcome to Green Party of Alberta leadership candidate, Brian Deheer. It's also my great pleasure to introduce Green Party of Alberta leadership candidate, Jordan Wilkie. Okay, so uh, both candidates will have three minutes to make opening and closing statements. Questions will be posed to each of the candidates, and they will have two minutes to answer each question. A 10-second warning will be given, and if the candidate exceeds the time limit, I will start talking over them. <laughs> that will be your signal to, that we are moving on. Uh, the questions will be posed by a combination of prepared questions from yours truly, and those composed by you, the audience. Uh, we have uh, our two young Green Party people who will be going throughout uh, the audience. Uh, and basically, we're just asking you, we have uh, these notepads that are making the rounds. Uh, if you have a question, just hold it up, and our two youngest Greens will uh, come and retrieve the questions and carry them to me, okay? Um, so I, all I ask is that you make them le uh, legible. Uh, and uh, if you uh, direct a question to one specific question uh, candidate, I'm going to ask that question of the other candidate in the interest of fairness. So, the questions will be asked in approximately 15-minute sessions. None of the questions posed have been made available to the candidates in advance. So, the participants uh, in today's debate took part in two coin flips prior to today's event. One was to determine who speaks first in the initial 15-minute uh, uh, session, and the other was to uh, determine who begins with the opening statement. And at this time, I'd like to invite Brian to here to make his three-minute opening statement. All right, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Nice to see everyone here. Uh, oh, one oh, here. There we go. Can everybody hear that? Way in the back. Awesome. Well, all kinds of thumbs up. Thank you, uh, and I'll say again, uh, welcome to everyone. Nice to see so many people here. Uh, for Ian, Ian, thank you so much for that uh, uh, teaching and acknowledgement. Uh, I learned some, some more things there, and I appreciate that uh, very much. Um, 
I always feel pressured under these things. I know there's three minutes, so I'll just try and tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I live in Lacovish. I'm a musician. I'm self-employed. I teach music lessons at home and local schools. Uh, and in addition to that, I have various um, groups that I volunteer with. Uh, several of them are watershed stewardship related. Uh, that's one of the kinds of activities that I uh, volunteer in. Feel is, is a way of trying to help us uh, live in, in harmony with Mother Earth a little better. Um, and I have run as a Green Party candidate uh, six different times. Three times as a provincial candidate, three times as a federal candidate. Um, I guess I, I could mention I've been the deputy leader for a, a period of time with Rami. Uh, I'm on the um, Shadow Cabinet, and I'm on the Policy Development, uh, Policy Development Committee. Um, so I've been involved with the uh, Green Party of Alberta for, I think, eight years. I was looking at the other day, and uh, I forgot it's eight years or four more or less, but uh, so a number of years. Uh, and I'm very uh, committed to trying to, uh, to help build the party. Uh, I see that that's been something that has been working on quite a lot over the past few years. Uh, I see a lot of really good things happening in that respect. Uh, so I'm very encouraged, and uh, uh, I think that would be my focus. I'd be looking at uh, the party, uh, looking towards the next election, and the election after that, and the election after that, because I think we need to be looking at the very long term to, uh, to see us try and do something like good work that the party can contribute to the problems. I'll leave it at that. I don't know if that was three minutes. But Thank you very much, Brian. And now I'll hand things over to Jordan for his opening statement. Thanks, Chris. And uh, yes, thanks, Ian. I appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who's come. Um, it's a beautiful day here. And so for you guys to spend it with us is a true privilege and an honor. Uh, it's a true privilege and honor to be here standing and talking to you guys now because uh, I know that. You guys are the heart of the party. You are the membership. And those that want to sign up and join this wave, um, I'm just here to be that inspiration and to give those messages. So more than anything, I'm your spokesperson. I'm, I'm here for you. And uh, my background is that uh, I was born here and um, came back to Edmonton to, to do some good, to do some help. And uh, I did that by coming back and joining the fire department here. I've been working as a firefighter for over 13 years now. And so every day I'm here trying to help. And um, I went and got my disaster management uh, master's degree because, again, I wanted to help. And I wanted to create larger policies uh, that could do some good for you know, the wider range of people. Instead of just you know, showing up every day <coughs> to the truck, I want to help people in large amounts. So, I want to tell you that because that's the reason why I'm standing in front of you today is that I'm here to help and that there's a lot going on in this world and it's very overwhelming but I think that I see great inspiration coming out of the Green Party and uh, working federally with Valerie Kennedy in the last election I really learned a lot about what we can take from these six principles that uh, the Green International Movement has shown us and really just share and show people that there's another option for people. And this is an important time for us because we can see that there's an emergency right now, there's a climate issue, there's social issues, and we need someone that can stand up and be another option for people. Create legitimacy with this Green Party and create a new era. So this is the time for someone young and enthusiastic that's gonna create efficient messaging and inspirational leadership so that we can tap into this incredible, incredible uh, movement that's going on all over Alberta and the world. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just going to bring people together. And I've been doing this for three years uh, with projects of community building. Um, I've worked with some people in the room here together. And we bring people together for great causes, community causes, and for a better world. And so that's what I'm here for, and that's why I'm standing up. Uh, as I relayed uh, previously, 
Uh, we did draw to the who speaks first on the question, so we'll, we'll go in 15 minute segments, uh, approximately 15 minute uh, segments. And so at this time, and thanks, I see the questions coming in. Thank you very much. So uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, address, uh, so we already have four questions which, uh, from the audience, so keep them coming, and we're going to five questions, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to integrate that in. Right. So uh, first things first, though, I, I just wanted uh, to ask you uh, both a general and a specific question. And uh, so Jordan will be answering first in this session, uh, Brian second. So uh, first of all, uh, Jordan, uh, how do you regard political leadership? What, to your mind, is the purpose of political leadership, and how do you see this as it pertains to the Green Party of Alberta? So we've got to... okay. Yeah, kind of similar to what I said earlier, um, under Article 8.1 of the bylaws, the leadership is literally a spokesperson. I'm here to advocate for the policies that the Green Party implements, and so that's what I'm here for. I'm here to be the face and to reach out and connect people passionately about what we stand for. Because what we stand for is, is, not, is not really getting out to the people. People think we're an environmental party. We are. But we're also many other things. And to add from the six principles, things like the respect for diversity, uh, things like the uh, nonviolence, participatory democracy, uh, we need to be pushing this, and the social justice one is, is one that people don't really know about, and they always look to the NDP. So it's time for us to come out and say, okay, well, we're more than a, a one-trick pony, and the uh, Green Party is something that is legitimate and can, and can be something that is inspirational for the future. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jordan. Uh, Brian, your turn. Two minutes, please. Thanks. Uh, well, I would echo a lot of the things that uh, Jordan mentioned. Yes, the, the party leader's role is the role of a spokesperson, speaks on behalf of the party uh, to the general public and also to media. Uh, but as Jordan was saying, also to members of uh, the party. And, and I see that as well as a very important role, uh, especially in light of uh, where the Green Party of Alberta uh, finds itself uh, at this point in history. Um, it, uh, it has gone through some turbulent times, and uh, it's, it's been rebuilding quite well, I think, since then. Uh, but still, there's, there's considerable need for, uh, for building the party up, both in terms of memberships, also in terms of constituency associations. Uh, the CAs, after all, are the support network for all candidates. And so uh, uh, I can attest to uh, the difficulty of running as a candidate without having the support of a constituency association. Uh, and uh, I can see the huge value of having those. So ideally, we should have 87 of those for every single line in the province. Um, but also seeing that our uh, membership uh, is engaged and is uh, active and taking part in the direction of the party, helping you to contribute to policies. Uh, there's definitely lots of uh, roles for volunteers for helping to organize, uh, for building up donations, and so on. So that's, I think, the role of uh, the party leader, and uh, so I will do my best to try and do okay, Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, so we're going to start with the first audience uh, question, and uh, this is uh, from an audience member, and here it is. Uh, so Jordan, you'll be answering first, as per the format. So uh, the question is, how will you get the attention of populist Albertans and make the Green Party a relevant voice and power in Canadian <coughs> politics? So it's a general question, but a very direct question, which I'm sure is on the minds of members. So Jordan, uh, please start, and once again, you have two minutes. Yeah, I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. So I'm reaching out to people constantly. I'm out there talking to people. And I've already raised the membership by 15 to 20 percent. I haven't run the numbers lately, but the membership has increased now by 15 percent of people who have green values and want to join us. And so, reaching out to people is kind of what I'm best at. And I can throw events all over this this province, and I can drive my electric car all over this province. And I basically want to tell tell people that, you know, we represent more than just the environment. 
And I think that that's really the key to getting people together, because people know what we're about when it comes to the environment, but they don't understand the social issues that we also speak out towards, and all the good things that are in our policies and the six principles. So, just engagement, and uh, I'll continue to be able to raise that through creating an effective and efficient team, and going out and creating, doing events, being out in the public, creating social and mainstream media campaigns that can really reach out to people so they can feel what we're talking about and they can make that decision of, of joining us or not. Because right now I don't think they see us as a, as a viable option. And I want to make sure that they know that we're here and we're growing and we're riding off all the incredible things that are happening internationally and federally and working bilaterally with the federal party and some of these other organizations that are creating this momentum will allow us to really come out as a front runner in the future. And the time is now, so we need to get to work. Sign off. So thank you. And uh, Brian, uh, your turn to answer this question. Please. Yes. Okay. So here is the question: How will you get the attention of populist Albertans and make the Green Party a relevant voice? And, uh, yes, populist. Populist. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, populist uh, Albertans and make the Green Party a relevant voice and power in Canadian politics. So once again, Brian, uh, you have two minutes. Hey, thanks. Um, well, again, I would echo some of the things that Jordan mentioned. Uh, I would also be interested in, uh, in doing some events around the province. Uh, I, I recognize the value of that because I know that uh, uh, in-person, face-to-face contact is probably the best. Uh, works the best in, in terms of building support. Um, but I also have been recognizing what I've been hearing from uh, various people after the federal election, uh, and that is that the Green Party's voice can have a huge impact on the policies of other parties. The specific one that I remember from the, the federal election is that uh, the, uh, the various uh, strong points that Elizabeth May made on the climate crisis really pushed other parties to go farther with their commitments on, uh, on climate action. Uh, and I think here in Alberta, I think that's what the, uh, the Green Party of Alberta could do as well. Uh, and that could give the party uh, a huge, uh, greater impact than what its, its size and its resources might suggest. Uh, so, um, I also, as a musician, you can imagine, I would also like to see music be a part of these kinds of events. Uh, so that's why I usually try and bring my guitar with me everywhere I go. At our meet and greet last night, we did some, some music. I uh, brought my guitar with me here today in case afterwards anybody wants to uh, have a sing along or sing to my aunt. But uh, uh, the other aspect of it that I feel contributes greatly is uh, press releases from the, the party leader. And I know that the, uh, the party leader can, can benefit from uh, input from the <coughs> members and the shadow cabinet Ten seconds and the policy those. committee to give really strong, uh, assertive uh, press releases critiquing the government and proposing really worthwhile alternatives. Fine, thank you. Uh, we're going to ask Brian to answer uh, first, Jordan to answer second in this 15-minute uh, uh, segment. Uh, so just, that's going to close up. Okay, so apologies for the mumbling. So uh, here's the next audience question. And Brian, you are to, to lead, if you don't mind. Uh, and so uh, we have a question that says, uh, what one thing do you wish to accomplish in the role? And again, uh, two minutes, please. One thing. Okay, well, that's a tough question to answer because the role involves many, many tasks. Um, I guess I would... My best uh, approach to answering that, I think, would be uh, to take inspiration from uh, other green leaders that have inspired me. So uh, I can very quickly mention Elizabeth May was the person that motivated me uh, to get involved in the first place. Um, I've also been inspired by the, uh, the previous three leaders of the Green Party of Alberta, Janet Keeping, uh, Rami Tittle, and uh, Cheryl Shang on Grey Eyes. And the various other people in the party who have been uh, very dedicated 
uh, in keeping the party going and uh, I would say sort of carrying the flame. Uh, to me, I think my, my main goal would be to try and uh, enable the party uh, to rise to the challenge in the current <coughs> political uh, situation, but uh, to, be, to remain true to the green principles, uh, really that's, that's I think the primary goal for me. Um, what's very important is that uh, you know the, the work happens that's that's going to help us uh, live in harmony with Mother Earth, live in a sustainable way, uh, think in the long term, uh, and that would be my commitment. So I think that's my best uh, answer there. Thank you, Brian. Jordan, please. Two minutes. Wow, this is way easier going second. <laughs> okay, so uh, we need to get an MLA elected. This is the main goal of my leadership. We need representation in the ledge, maybe not one, but four. We need to be absolutely involved. And so to be um, to do that, we need to be more organized, of course, as I spoke to earlier. Uh, raising our membership, that's something that I can do easily. That's something that I'm already doing for you guys. That's what we're, we're about as leaders, is inspiration. And then getting out and making a green party more of a social movement. Like, if we're going to do fundraising, let's do fundraising, but let's plant trees. Let's do actual active uh, movements that will create what we're, what we're trying to get to anyways. So we can do all types of fundraising. Um, and we can do all types of organization that will lead to getting you know, a few people elected. And this is a way of interacting with the general public and allowing them to be part of something, to feel like they're part of the Green Party. And we're not just here speaking to them, but we're speaking with them and uh, we can move together. So that's my main reason for being a leader. And uh, that's what I'm gonna be doing in the next election, not three elections from now. Uh, thank you very much, Jordan. And the next question, uh, fundraising is key to any modern political party, and until now, our party has dramatically underperformed in this area. How will you change that? Uh, Brian, you first, please, and two minutes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yes, it is tougher going first, yes. isn't it? Yes. Um, yeah, thinking while you're talking, absolutely. Um, I think my first uh, the first place that I go to is I would rely on the uh, the excellent resourcefulness of party members. Um, uh, if I was the leader, I'd be asking the party members for ideas. What can we do to try and increase our fundraising? Uh, come up with a strategy. Uh, certainly, I would volunteer something like musical events. Uh, you've heard me mention that before. Uh, and that has been discussed in the past. We haven't uh, made very much use of that, and I certainly would be interested in doing that. Uh, music is always a great uh, thing that we share and that brings people together. So is food, uh, so events uh, where we share meals. Um, trying to get out to all of the communities in the province, uh, both settler and indigenous communities. Uh, as I said earlier, I feel that in-person, face-to-face contact is extremely uh, powerful and, and beneficial. So um, I would be making use of <coughs> any and all of those ideas for, for helping to increase our fundraising. Thank you, Brian, very much. Uh, Jordan, you have two minutes, please. Thanks, yeah, and music is great. Um, I ran the one of the biggest uh, Green Party events last year for uh, um, Valerie Kennedy, and we got a um, huge unifying force of, of uh, some people who were in this room, are in this room that were there, um, and we got a lot of people in, in one room together, and the power in that room was really tangible, and it really showed that we can keep doing that and extrapolate from that, so that's definitely a, a good idea, Brian. And then, um, but like, yeah, money, in, money to the party, that's what we're talking about. Uh, I was able to raise $45,000 in 40 days. Uh, how did I do that? Uh, basically, I inspired people to think about their communities and what they want out of their communities, making them safer and stronger and more resilient. And so that's easily done with the Green Party, is that we're looking out for people's future here. You know, I have a three-year-old son. This is not lost on me. Um, what would I give to um, a movement that's saying, hey, we're, we're advocating for your son's future? 
you know, his ability to breathe clean air, you know, this is something that I want to give to. Um, I believe that creating large grassroots movements creates a cascading domino effect. And when people can see, okay, wow, these guys have raised $45,000, they want to get involved. And so breaking those thresholds are something that I can do. And that's definitely um, a way to get the youth uh, engaged as well. And using young um, millennials to work with them so that they can reach out with their messaging that relates to um, the new generation that's coming into votership. That's huge. And uh, it's not what we're doing right now, but that's where I want to take us. And uh, I know the people that can do it. I already have a team that works really well together. And uh, I'm really excited to just work with everyone in this room Thank you. Thank you very much. and beyond. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jordan. And the next question comes from a audience uh, member, and here is the question. And so Brian, uh, be prepared, uh, and Jordan as well. So here is the question that says, what policy mechanisms are you in favor of that would relocalize food, water, energy, banking, and justice priorities? And, go slower, go slower. and processes within the province. I'll repeat the question. <laughs> so I'll repeat the question. Uh, so what policy mechanisms, okay, policy mechanisms are you in favor of that will relocalize the following? Food, water, energy, banking, and justice priorities and processes within the province. So having been a former PhD student, uh, this is a thesis. <laughs> so so uh, which, which makes me uh, uh, pleased to say, uh, two minutes please, Brian. <laughs> you don't have two I got minutes. this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jordan, you're going to have to answer. Obviously, it's a huge question. Uh, I don't think anyone is able to answer that in two minutes or less, but uh, uh, and certainly I can say that certainly some of these are, are concepts that I've been contemplating, I've been trying to study up on. Uh, so relocalizing all of these things, to me a lot of that has to do with supporting local communities, uh, decentralizing them from uh, you know large government centers, large corporations, uh, putting control back in local <coughs> communities. Uh, I know there are various policies in our uh, in our Green Party of Alberta policy document that do touch on these. Uh, we probably could go farther with those. Um, for me, I know a big, uh, a strong emphasis that I appreciate is uh, on cooperatives. I know that cooperatives can be very helpful in, in bringing local control back to the, the community uh, as opposed to you know being at the mercy of head office somewhere in you know, Vancouver or Eastern Canada or, or outside the country. Um, I'm not sure I can add too much more in, in another 15 seconds, so I think I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. And Jordan, uh, two minutes, please. Okay, yeah, so it comes down to engaging um, with communities and uh, understanding how we can make communities more resilient. Um, Yes, as we can see with the current issues uh, going on today, um, supply lines are um, uh, being broken down to an extent that things can't get around. Um, and this can happen at any time due to climate and disaster emergencies. So um, really, community resilience and, and, and bringing strong communities to the table is a huge thing that the Green Party can do. Now, the mechanisms are not... Um, really in the policies from what I've seen. We have some things about flooding, some things about forest fires. Um, as far as our agriculture is concerned, uh, there's definitely a lot of talk about um, per moving into permaculture, um, more sustainable farming, things like this. They're not relying on these heavy supply lines. That's definitely a huge way to uh, localize. Um, water, definitely working together to create uh, decentralized uh, utility issues. Um, there's a lot of already um, organizations that are working to decentralize their power system and we can really tie into that with our water systems and things like that. Now banking and uh, justice, um, I 
don't see any policies that relate to that within our um, our platform or anything. So that's definitely something that that we need to look at together and to to work on together. Um, but yeah, community resilience will always make the the whole stronger. And uh, there's a lot that can be done, um, but what, if you want to talk about policy mechanisms, uh, they're just not there. And so really working on um, some of these are important because our future is so uncertain and we definitely need to create um, new policies that will help us transition our power systems and our food systems into more uh, localized um, and uh, sustainable um, supply lines for, for communities especially out in rural Alberta. Thank you very much, Jordan. Okay, so we're going to, uh, the, for this next question, we're going to combine one of my questions with an audience uh, member question. So uh, I'm going to say that uh, while we are all, in a larger sense, responsible for recruiting, one of the attributes of a good political leader is that they are able to bring new people into the party from various communities and interests. Uh, what is your plan in this regard? And so this uh, dovetails nicely with the uh, audience question, and it says one of the greatest challenges of our, to our party is lack of members and cash flow. And how would you address this? And it's uh, the question here is please, or the uh, the asking is please present a few concrete steps. Okay. So uh, Brian, uh, you first, please. Uh, two minutes. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, actually, and that, that's an excellent question. Um, one of the first things that, uh, that I would be looking at is uh, trying to network with like-minded groups. Uh, this isn't my own idea. It came up at a recent, uh, I forget if it was a policy meeting or a, or a special general meeting or annual general meeting, but uh, uh, the point has been made uh, that there are lots of groups in Alberta that are working on some of the same kinds of goals as our party is that are in our policy documents and uh, so I've actually had contact with a few groups like that uh, Al Alberta Environmental Network uh, I actually am now on their board um, I've also come to know some people at uh, is it Iron and Earth I think I have the name correctly I see some nods good I remembered it correctly um, Iron and Earth is an organization of um, people who used to work in the oil sands industry or oil and gas industry and are now working uh, using the same kinds of skills uh, to help uh, build our renewable energy uh, infrastructure. So, uh, and a lot of those skills are transferable. Their website shows their perspective is very well grounded. Uh, it reflects uh, indigenous principles of being in harmony with the earth very well as well. So I have a lot of respect for that group. Uh, and there are numerous groups like that. Uh, the Pemina Institute, uh, on energy. Uh, I'm surprised that in any of the questions that so far it hasn't come up very much about alternative energy, renewable energy. Um, there are lots of groups working on that <coughs> and that's exactly the kind of direction that the Green Party of Alberta is, is hoping to, to pursue and, and uh, uh, speak out for in Alberta. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Jordan, two minutes, please. Yeah, so what we're talking about is the Green Wave. Um, this is going to happen. Um, how? What are the concrete steps? Well, basically everyone needs to go out and talk about the Green Party. Uh, the membership, it's their responsibility just as much as mine uh, as a member to go out and to talk to people, to, in, to integrate with organizations as, as Brian's talked about. But the guys from uh, Iron and Earth, I mean, they're from BC who started it and they're not, in, they're not members right now. What we need to do is empower the membership to get out and be involved. And uh, seeing this group right here now today, I mean, that wave is happening. Uh, by increasing the membership already, by I, I believe probably over 20%, that's already happening. People are excited. And people already have our values, which is amazing. We just have to tell them about it. We just have to go out to the events. I went out to Green Drinks in the city. I, I, going around talking to people. A lot of people, they, they don't believe that the Green Party can do it, but they want to hear about it. And after I talk to them, guess what? They remember tomorrow. Because they didn't realize, oh, you guys have six principles. Oh, okay, you believe in this as well. 
And really, the environment's great, and we can talk about the environment so we're blue in the face, but until we start getting concrete and about the other issues that we represent, talking about helping people, talking about healthcare, talking about standing up for Albertans that are getting the short end of the stick right now, that's when people go, okay, yeah, that and the environment. And that's when the wave really starts to go. And if we get an MLA in, well, now we've opened the doors. We're gonna get in, we're gonna swing the doors open, and this is how we create real change, not just talk, because since I've come on as leader as candidate, Tom, I've already you. created that wave. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks very much. Thank you for that. Okay, so we're now moving into a new 15-minute segment, and this time uh, Jordan will lead the, question, uh, the answering of the questions for the next 15 minutes. And uh, as it turns out, uh, Jordan, we have an audience question that is uh, directed to you. Brian, I'm going to reword the question uh, so that you can answer it uh, after Jordan has his uh, answer. All right. So, um, so Jordan, uh, if elected leader, what uh, will your priority be if there is a fire emergency during an election campaign? Uh, uh, where you booked? So, so I think I'm just going to leave it at that. So. Uh, have you thought about this? And uh, two minutes, please. So we work on a platoon schedule. Uh, I'm not a volunteer firefighter. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professional. So we, we work on a platoon schedule. So right now, I'm not going to get called out. I am already, there's guys that are, and girls that are hanging out at the station ready to go. Um, so that's not an issue. Um, you know, I can trade shifts. So actually, I get six days off twice a month, and then I can trade shifts. So I can be at... at at where I need to be uh, for the Green Party, that's not an issue. Um, it's more about making sure my wife is, is okay with everything. <laughs> you should talk to her more than, more than the flyers. Um, but no, I'm just kidding. We're, uh, you know, I, I'm here for you, as you can see. I'm trying to be accessible. I'm trying to uh, do meetups. Um, I'm going out to Calgary uh, in a week or two, and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue to go around Alberta and make sure I can talk to people and be accessible to people. And that's really, really, really important to me. And I think that that's the job of a leader. Um, what else can I say about fires? I was, you know, when Fort Mac was on fire, I was the first person uh, showing up to the uh, shelter to help people there. So, you know, they, they, they know that I'm, people know that I'm there when they need me. And that's what I'm going to promise to you guys, is if you need me, I'll be there. Thank you very much, Jordan. And uh, Brian, uh, so... Uh, since you don't have a professional obligation that is similar, I was just wondering, uh, under what circumstances uh, would you uh, have to break off a campaign? Um, uh, so what is that line uh, in your experience? Uh, so let's just say we're in the thick of a general election or a by-election and you're a candidate. Uh, what would cause you to break away? And I'll leave it at that. Uh, you have two minutes, please. Yeah. I was trying to think how you're going to adapt the question to my circumstances. Um, being a musician, uh, I thought it might have something to do with a gig. <laughs> but uh, obviously that wouldn't take priority over, uh, over uh, leadership responsibilities. But I think I get the gist of the question is, uh, are you committed, are you dedicated to the role, or are there things that would uh, take you away from it? Um, you know, realistically, I can't see anything. The only thing that remotely comes to mind that I don't necessarily want to entertain is my mom is getting quite old. And uh, so I try and go and visit her as much as I can. Um, and uh, she lives in BC. So I would hope that there wouldn't be any kind of unpleasant uh, uh, circumstance that would call me away uh, related to my mom. But uh, no, I think generally I would feel myself uh, committed to the role of leader, uh, and that would take first priority. Thank you very much. So uh, we're continuing with questions, and the next one is, uh, recent events have highlighted the ongoing lack of respect for Indigenous peoples in Canada, and by extension, Alberta. What is your reading of the current situation, and what ought to be done by the Green Party uh, of Alberta? And. Uh, we're going to ask. Give us both a minute because this is a, okay. a question that's worth notes. Yeah, so I'll repeat the question. 
So recent events have highlighted the ongoing lack of respect for Indigenous peoples in Canada and by extension Alberta. What is your reading of the current situation and what ought to be done as Green Party people? What can we do? And uh, Brian, where's uh, uh, actually, pardon me, it's Jordan first, for two minutes, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the first thing we can do um, is not speak for these people. Um, it's very important that they speak for themselves. And this is a very complex issue, so a lot of issues seem to get washed into um, these uh, the indigenous um, situation um, that, that, well, where they're feeling a lack of respect, if that's what we're talking about. So, as a Green Party leader uh, and a non-Indigenous, all I can do is be an ally to their cause and to listen. And it's time that we listened a lot more uh, before we go out, run out, and try and help because we've been trying to help for a while now without listening and so if members of our party are involved and are indigenous and they want to speak out I would be there to listen as the leader and to communicate what they are feeling um, if we want to start talking about federal issues and land titles and, and things like this. Um, you know, I know Elizabeth May is re um, speaking out, <coughs> recently said a title is a title is a title, and we should listen to the Supreme Court. But as a provincial leader, I think that being an ally and listening uh, and being supportive when we are asked to be supportive is the key to answering this question. All right, Brian, uh, thank you. Jordan and Brian, you have two minutes now. Could you repeat as Sure. So here is the question. Recent events have highlighted the ongoing lack of respect for Indigenous peoples in Canada and by extension, Alberta. What is your reading of the current situation and what ought to be done? Two minutes, please. All right, thanks. Okay, two minutes. Well, that's absolutely not going to be enough. Uh, but. Uh, this is something that's been on my mind a lot, partly because of my living experience. Living in Lac La Biche, um, I live close <coughs> to uh, two First Nations, uh, close to two Métis settlements. Um, in my time there, I've worked for uh, the Students Association of Portage College uh, for 14 years. And the college, at uh, one time, had about 85% Indigenous students in their population. Uh, I have worked with colleagues and friends uh, indigenous colleagues, friends, and elders. Uh, I've uh, learned about the United Nations Declaration about a decade and a half ago, uh, have been following the, the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation since that came out. Um, have learned about Murray Sinclair, Senator, uh, former judge, uh, and also the, the uh, uh, what was the title of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? See, the, not the chair. Uh, sorry, the TRC. Yes, yeah, but uh, I forget the title that he had for that. But he was involved in the. Uh, he was the head of the, the TRC, um, and certainly um, he. Um, I can refer to an article that he just published, which was referring to the the difficulties uh, in BC, the issues and the protests uh, that Canada needs to sort out sovereignty with First Peoples, and absolutely I agree. Um, that needs to be sorted out, and as, as Jordan mentioned, Elizabeth May has pointed out that the courts, I think, have settled that, have said that there is sovereignty with the Wet'suwet'en people uh, that should seconds, be administered please. through the, the hereditary chiefs. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna be able to add more in eight seconds, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so we have our next question from the audience, and uh, the preamble goes, Alberta has thousands of oil and gas citizens. How will you bring them over to our side? 
And we're asking Jordan to answer this firstly, and you have two minutes, Jordan. Um, personally, I don't believe that there's oil and gas citizens. Um, I think that we're all in this together. And the more we can speak to that, to the unification between I'm oil and gas, I'm not oil and gas, oil and gas doesn't love you back, oil and gas loves you, you're anti-energy. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? That's not how we come together and that's not the world that I want to live in, it's not the world that I want my child to live in. Uh, we're in this together. Um, Iron and Earth is a, is a great example of oil workers that have left the oil industry to say, look, it, my skills can already apply to a more sustainable way of creating energy and I want to get on it because there's a few reasons. One being the climate, which we all know about. The other one being the fact that the more we pump into this industry, it's like running towards a cliff. So we need to be more effective and efficient in our oil and gas. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not anti-oil and gas. We need to transition. We need to think about how we can transition for the future. And so when I go and talk to them, I'm not saying, hey, we're this, you're that. Come over our side or else the sun, you know, the fires are going to happen and it's over, right? It's like, we're in this together, guys. And we all have families and we all want this. We want the best for Albertans. We want the best for our families and future generations. And so, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm showing them that there's a bridge here and that we need to work together and that the transition is actually a huge way to move into a modern society that is working together for a sustainable future and there's a ton of money in it guys there's a ton of jobs involved tons and we're missing out by just feeding into this idea that it's oil and gas or else alberta right no alberta is many things and uh not there's no such thing as an oil and gas citizen Thank you. Uh, Jordan and Brian, uh, two minutes, please, on the same question. All right, thanks. Uh, again, I will echo a number of the things that Jordan mentioned. Uh, yes, there are different types of voters. I don't think it's, I agree, it, it's, it's not uh, helpful necessarily to categorize voters uh, according to an industry or any other attribute. Uh, there are lots of different types of voters. Uh, urban, rural, within any, within any group, there will be people with different uh, preferences and different values. What I want to share is I had an experience with an organization called Inside Education. Uh, they work with educators, with school teachers. They invited me to speak, along with a few other people from Lakovish, on watersheds and how water relates to the oil and gas industry. When they, and they were on tour, they had done some sessions in Fort McMurray, they got to Lakovish, uh, the people from Inside Education pointed out that in their discussions, uh, various times they had been talking with people in the oil industry to whom the term environmentalist seemed to be a bad word. But on hearing those people talk about, yes, I work in the oil industry, but I notice that there are these things that the industry does that pollutes or that have negative impacts, and I'm not comfortable with that. They were displaying environmentalist values, environmental values. Uh, so I see that as something that, uh, you know, voters, as you say, Jordan, if you point things out to them, uh, they recognize, yes, that connects, that fits, that, uh, you know, echoes my values. Uh, that would be my approach. I think that's, that's kind of the, the way to, to uh, bring people on side. Sustainability. What does sustainability mean to you? To Laurie. Thanks. Yeah, again, that's another huge question. Uh, the first place I'll go to on that is the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. For anyone who's not familiar, I hope everyone is, because uh, I think there's some really good work that's been done there. There are 17 goals. Uh, they cover all aspects of society and all aspects of economic activity. Um, there's been lots of good work that's been done there. Um, to me, sustainability is also looking at the long term. I've mentioned that. Um, I'm familiar with the, uh, the indigenous belief of looking to uh, the, the future generations, looking you know, into the long term future. Uh, I would see sustainability, uh, if I had to draw a picture, imagine you know, Alberta with um, 
lots of electric vehicles and with renewable energy sources so that we're not, I don't think we're burning coal anymore, but we're not burning natural gas. Uh, we would make renewable electricity. Uh, we'd have low emission vehicles, low emission uh, public transit. Uh, we would have uh, homes and buildings that are insulated so that uh, they're very efficient. Um, we would have conservation values implemented across our uh, cities, towns, and countrysides uh, so that we have protection for uh, bio biodiversity and species. Uh, that would be my picture of sustainability. <coughs> Thank you, Brian. Jordan, uh, two minutes, please. Thanks. So, yeah, we have six core uh, principles and then lots of tons of values. So this principle being sustainability um, really ties into everything. Um, there's no point in really talking about uh, how we're going to uh, move forward unless we can talk about how that thing can, can work for a better society. So when we look at, let's say, the energy industry, of course, sustainability, we're talking about sun, wind, thermal, and all the new technologies that are available that don't see the light of day because certain industries are very powerful and they just want you to think about one thing. Now, I already talked about running as fast as we can towards a cliff. Not sustainable. We can talk about our food supply um, until we're blue in the face. We talk about water and the resources that are all around us. We can't keep living in this way. So it's an attitude shift. And it's a way of looking at sort of culture. And this, as the Green Party, we're role models for a new culture. And that's really important for people because people are depressed. And they're looking for something to get behind. And so it's really important that when we talk about sustainability, we talk about our own party as well. We talk about our own habits. How can we be more sustainable? And how can we lead as examples? And I firmly believe that, whether I'm playing hockey or firefighting or whatever. I'm a leader by example. So my wife and I and our family, and then we're going out from there. So we're just creating a circle and ripples into our community. I'm talking with, I have a huge community here. I'm so blessed. And we're always talking about it. How can we make the difference? How can we be the example? And so, sure, 17 UN sustainability goals, that's great. But how can you be Time is part up. of the solution. Thank you very much, Jordan. And we have uh, another question from the audience. Uh, it says it's uh, sort of similar to a previous question. I'm going to ask it anyway because it uh, contains the words renewable energy. Uh, what's your plan to cross over from oil and gas to renewable? So you both agree that we should be doing it. What's, what pathway should we be taking? And uh, Brian, uh, two minutes to you first, please, on this topic. Okay, well, I'll do my best. Um, the, uh, the particular renewable energies that, uh, that I have been thinking of and focusing on are solar and wind and geothermal. Uh, there may be some others that also merit uh, attention, uh, but I know that uh, uh, Alberta has been in installing lots of uh, wind turbines in the south for quite a while. Years ago, I became a member of uh, Bullfrog Power which is, uh, oh, I see somebody nodding, uh, a way that you can uh, make it so that the electricity that you consume in your house is, is uh, displaced by uh, green energy generated from wind turbines uh, into the grid. So I've been doing that for a number of years. Um, with solar, uh, recently I was at a, uh, uh, a webinar where we were hearing about the town of Raymond. Uh, town of Raymond or village? Uh, in southern Alberta, and that uh, municipality has installed enough solar panels to entirely power all of their municipal buildings. Uh, and there are various other towns and municipalities that have been installing solar as well. Uh, the geothermal, I really wish that that would start uh, uh, catching hold. Um, somebody had mentioned to me recently that uh, federal MP, a conservative MP, Matt Jenneru, had a proposal in the last term in the House of Commons to encourage the abandoned wells to be converted to geothermal uh, power. So uh, I really wish that geothermal would get some more support in Alberta as well. Um, in terms of my plan for getting to those things, 
I, I would I can only think to try and support the various organizations. I know there's the solar power Ten sec uh, Ten seconds, organization, please. there's a wind power organization, and so on. Uh, work with the groups that are already working in those directions, the Pemina Institute, and so on. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Jordan, two Can minutes. Um, sure. Okay, so uh, the question from the audience, the specific wording, what is your plan to cross over from oil and gas to renewable energy? Uh, two minutes. So this is what I spoke to earlier when we said we need to create a transition plan. Um, so that's not a transition plan. So the first thing I will do is reorganize and speak with my membership so that we can talk about that as a whole. We have so, talk about resources, we have incredible resources that I've already spoken to who know a lot more than I do about the oil and gas industry and the road that we're headed in and how to transition. So the first thing to do is, again, listen. Listen to my membership, listen to the experts, and get out there and create strategies that people are going to relate to. It's easy for us to say, turn wells into geothermal or you know, put up some more solar panels. Um, but unless we can get our messaging right and uh, let these people know that we're not after their jobs, we're working with them, that there are jobs in these industries that we need to be tapping into, that's another resource, right? So turning people against each other is a really great thing that oil and gas has done, and we need to move away from that. And so it starts with people, and it starts with them being inspired to work with us, and to work with other organizations, uh, like Brian's talking about, that are already doing amazing things. And so that's the first goal is we can come together and start creating a transition plan, but it starts with transitioning our attitudes toward the way we speak to people and how we can come together. Um, concrete things, I mean, no one wants to invest in dirty oil anymore. Uh, BlackRock has $7 trillion and they're not investing in, in things that are gonna hurt the climate. So the money, if we're gonna talk about money, which is what a lot of people wanna hear, well, it's not in oil and gas. So let's diversify and let's make oil and gas more efficient and effective while we transition. That's just as important as transitioning. Is what can we do right now with what we have more efficient, more effective? That's in your own home, that's with the car you're driving, and that's with our energy sector right now. <coughs> let's transition that and then let's look for solutions. Thank you, okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jordan. And so we're on to the next question, and that is, uh, the great human rights champion, playwright, and former president of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel, once said that politics should not be about the art of the possible. That given the various overarching crises facing humanity, we have to make politics the art of the impossible. In the age of the climate emergency, what are your impressions of that dilemma? So. So we have a, an overarching crisis. Uh, we commonly first, we, by the way. Yep, you're entering first. Okay, yes. Can you repeat? Sure. It's very poetic. So, so as you know, uh, we're we're constantly told in school, we're constantly told in the media that politics is the art of the possible, right? That's what we're constantly fed, and so this means negotiating, compromising, uh, perhaps to an extreme extent, perhaps, and. The, the thought by Havel was that in doing so, we are eliminating broader, deeper visions and directions uh, society needs to go given the crises we're facing. And so I use the example of the climate emergency. So again, it's a bit of a philosophical question, but it also will tell our membership uh, and reveal uh, some of your insights into political leadership and direction and vision. So two minutes, please. Sure. Two minutes or less, here goes. Um, it, right away this brings to mind, uh, I remember learning about a book by Chris Turner a few years ago. It was, I think it was called The Geography of Hope, A Vision of the World We Need. There was chapter by chapter that went through um, what at the time was groundbreaking, radical, unheard of, new uh, ways of, of doing things, again, that, that uh, let us live in harmony with Mother Earth that were sustainable, uh, and at that time, like I said, everything that was in those chapters, it was rare, it was exceptional. Um, so hearing this question, the art of the possible or the art of the impossible, uh, I think I get the point of it. 
But I will say I think there's a lot more of what used to be considered the impossible, I think a lot more of that is happening these days. Uh, and and uh, the examples that I gave a few minutes ago where I see things like that happening uh, in different parts of the world, in different parts of Canada, even here in Alberta, uh, I think those are, are things that give me hope. Um, if I were to focus on my interest in uh, bringing about greater respect and justice with Indigenous peoples, uh, I have to say I've been noticing lots of great um, uh, work from New Zealand that they are, I think, doing a lot of good work in respecting and bringing about more just relationships with Indigenous peoples there. Uh, I think that Canada could and should be moving in that same direction. So I, I take some, some guidance from, from what's been accomplished uh, in that area from New Zealand. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I, I, I agree we should be focusing on the art of the impossible, but we have lots Ten of good, yeah, good role models and good examples. Thank Thanks. you, Brian. And Jordan, uh, over to you uh, for the same question. Two minutes, please. Okay, yeah, the art of the impossible, right? Let's think about it. Um, as soon as that question got said, I thought of Martin Luther King. I have a dream. I have a dream, and the human rights movement made that a reality. So the impossible is nothing. When we speak to it, when we can message about it, and we have the inspirational leaders that can make sure that that message gets out to people. And so that's what I want to do. I'm, you know, I'm used to talking on stage, stage with thousands of people. I've done it at music festivals. Uh, I've been doing it for years now, and I'm happy to go out there and say, you know, this is possible. You think it's impossible? You think it's impossible to get an MLA, a green MLA? I don't. People are already telling me that. People are already sending me messages saying, you should stop doing what you're doing. I say, that means that they're scared. I've had people already tell me, it'll never happen. Guess what? They told me that all my life when I said I want to be a firefighter. You're too small, you're too skinny. Not gonna happen. There's too many applicants. It's not gonna happen. And guess what? I came back again and again and again, and I became a firefighter. Top of my class. And guess what? We can do this right here, right now, and it starts with one drop. Waterfall starts with one drop. It has to. And from that, look at all the incredible things that can change, and that can come from that. And so, I have a dream as well, and I think that we can make this a reality if we come together right here and right now and make momentum Ten seconds, please. from this time forward. And I need you guys with me to do that. You can't do it alone. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we're now about to start a, another 15 minute segment. And this time we're going to have Jordan uh, start that the GPA, Green Party of Alberta, should allow 14-year-olds to join as members. Uh, how, uh, it says here, this is the language, how will you uh, tap into the energy of the environmental protest movement? Okay, so we all saw the power of uh, Greta and the power of our indigenous youth uh, in October. And I assume that this question flows from it. So 14-year-olds should they be allowed to join the Green Party of Alberta. And uh, once again, we're asking uh, Jordan to start with uh, two minutes, please. That was, sorry, that was two questions. It was, should we let 14-year-olds join the party? Thank you. Thank you. So the, the explicit question is, do you believe that the GPA should allow 14-year-olds to join? Okay, and then the second one, how do you, uh, how would you tap into the energy of the environmental protest movement? Uh, great. 14-year-olds, um, I think that right now, personally, 16-year-olds, um, that's pretty young um, for people to get involved. I think that that's a good, age, but uh, really it's not up to me, is it? It's up to uh, my membership and uh, and a democratic uh, vote towards what we need to do next. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
this is coming from Greta. If it is coming from Greta, then that's amazing. And these people are, are huge role models for us, and, and, um, and that's exciting. Uh, what's more exciting is that people are actually out marching in the street here, you know. Um, internationally, that's great. But when you see 14,000 people marching across Alberta, I mean, there is a movement there that we need to be tapping into. How do we tap into it? We only need to relate to them. If it's a youth movement, we're not doing it with the messaging we have. It's pretty stodgy, and we're actually not reaching out at all through uh, the millennial um, uh, mediums that are available to us. So what we do need to do is obviously get people involved that uh, can create campaigns that are geared towards this population so that they understand that we are with them and that we are a choice. And we also need to go out to these marches in full effect because I went out and I looked around and you know you see the odd green t-shirt, maybe a sign. Uh, that's not enough, we need to be leading this. Um, as leader of the Green Party, I wanna be up there speaking to 14,000 people and telling them that we are with them, that we are, in it, that we are with them for uh, the environmental justice that they're looking for. Um, this is an easy thing to tap into when you're connected. And um, as a young person, I think I have the ability to connect with people and I do that every day. Um, thanks, so yeah, so we need young campaigns, we need young involvement, and we need to, to really show up. Thank you, Jordan. And Brian, you have two minutes for the same question, please. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, I do remember this question coming up at uh, previous uh, policy meetings and, and party uh, general meetings and so on. Um, I don't remember if it was resolved. I do remember that there was discussion to lower the uh, membership age. I think there's also been discussions of a policy that would uh, support lowering the voting age. I think that would, was something that also should go with this. I, I value uh, the involvement of young people very much. Uh, and uh, have a lot of respect for <coughs> Thunberg. Um, I was happy to be able to participate in the march, although when it came time for her to speak, I was behind a bunch of people, so all I can say is that I heard her speak. can't say that I saw her speak. Um, but uh, to, uh, to tap into the energy of, of youth that are, that are uh, passionate and, and interested in the environment, uh, I would like to see uh, the Green Party of Alberta simply give them an opportunity uh, to be involved because I think uh, students, if they haven't, or young people, if they have an opportunity, uh, appreciate that and, and take that up. I can demonstrate that with a, a story from Lakovich. I have been doing um, watershed uh, demonstration uh, talks in local schools for a number of years, and a couple of years ago, uh, the teacher contacted me back. She said, Brian, my students, they decided they wanted to try and do something to help our lake, uh, and they're gonna be painting yellow fish on all of the storm drains. So it's a visual reminder to people that that water flows directly into our lake. Um, that was, of course, unsolicited. It was spontaneous from the students in the class, but I think it demonstrates the point. Give somebody an opportunity, something they care about, and they take something on. 10 seconds, come please. Up with, come up with an idea. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so. Uh, the next question from the audience. Undermine the important whistleblowing role that animal rights investigators play uh, play in and the checks and balances of Alberta, Alberta's agricultural system. Will you find a way to protect animal rights activists from these draconian fines? Okay, so we, uh, do you both have that on your sites? I'm just writing down the last Part that was the question. <laughs> okay, yes, the question was Will you find a way to protect animal rights activists from these draconian fines? And we're asking you, uh, Jordan, to please start us off with uh, two minutes. Yeah, animal rights is something that is definitely in the Stone Age here, um, something that we can easily um, improve on. Um, we're kind of at the bottom of the barrel, I'd say. Um, and so I'm not, I can't say I, spe I know enough to, to talk about these fines. I do uh, know enough about animal rights that uh, I know that changes need to be made. And I think that uh, definitely we need a better policy on this. Um, our policy right now is uh, mostly dealing with protecting wildlife. Um, and that's great. But uh, you know, even within the, uh, the food, industrial food industry, 
um, there's a lot of checks and balances that we need to uh, take a look at. Um, but that's pretty that's pretty big. I think the main the main thing right now is to uh, focus on organizing people power because if we're going to stand up to the UCP and um, you know we need to be strong. So I'm recruiting members that are, are that I know from a lot of you know groups that have our values and you know animal rights is definitely one of our values for sure. Uh, it's in our policy. So I mean I worked I was the the leader of the of the Wolf Matters team here in. Edmonton, um, and I was dealing with politics all day long about caribou ha habitat and the, the way they use strychnine poison um, on bolts. And I just know how backwards things are because, um, you know, everyone wants to scapegoat. Everyone's going to scapegoat somebody. These fines sound like a scapegoat as well. Um, but there's systemic issues that we need to definitely look at. And I think that by, by modernizing and creating new policies that Hopefully, it can be implemented when we get MLA representation, and have it, and we can speak towards uh, animal rights a lot better. So the first thing to do is to get into the legislature, um, because I'm tired of petitioning. I've been petitioning all my life. Thank I've you very much. Twenty thousand petitions for the wolves. Nothing. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan and Brian. Could you give us two minutes on this topic, please? All right, I'll do my best. Um, the, uh, the question was phrased in such a way of uh, how will you find a way or, or will you find a way? I don't know if I can say that I will find a way uh, to protect animal, animal rights activists from these kinds of fines, but I'm definitely committed to trying to find a way. Uh, I can relate it actually to something that's, that's quite close to me as well. Uh, I think a lot of you are, are familiar with the, uh, the, the Kenny government's war room. Uh, which is directed not at animal rights activists, but at uh, people who care about the environment <coughs> and what the uh, oil and gas sector does that impacts the environment. Uh, and uh, I would say in both cases, those are uh, an offensive abuse of government's rights, uh, or government authority, sorry, government's authority, um, really to, to call it a war room, to be waging war on the citizens of your province. I find that absolutely unacceptable. Um, so yes, I would certainly try to find a way. All right, thank you very much. Uh, time is moving on. So here is the last question before closing statements. And I'm going to combine two questions uh, given us. And I, by the way, I've been asking these questions in the order that they were uh, presented to the table, okay? Uh, so uh, here is uh, the first of a two-part question. Uh, how will you convince the Alberta public that the downsides of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the Tech Frontier far outweigh the positives? And then the second part of that question from our youngest uh, participant today, how do you stop pipelines? Okay, and so uh, once again... Can I ask uh, the first part again, please, Chris? Certainly. So the first part... How will you convince the Alberta public that the downsides of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and Tech Frontier far outweigh the positives? And then you heard the second part, how do you stop pipelines? And Jordan, uh, you have two minutes, please. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, how do you answer that in two minutes? Well, if you've been listening to what I've been saying, then it's massive paradigm shift that we're looking at here. And um, the paradigm shift comes from talking to each other and finding the bridges to build um, for a transition away from oil and gas. If we know that oil and gas isn't profitable, well, why are we putting all, all our money in it? Why is my pension stolen and going towards propping up this industry? I'm mad, and uh, a lot of people are mad. But more so, we have to look at it, if we want to look at it in profits, because that's what people are talking about. They're talking about the profits. They're not talking about the, oh, is this a good thing for the environment? No, they're talking about profits. So um, for the oil and gas industry, climate change is not profitable. Uh, protests are not profitable. Uh, massive marching in the street, not profitable. So what is profitable? The transition to energy is profitable. The respecting land rights Stopping 
the need for protests and listening to the citizens of Alberta, that's profitable. The transition is easy. We just need to get it out there. The messaging is the hard part. There's a million things that we can be doing and there's a million things that I can say are, these are the pros and they outweigh weigh these and we can go through spreadsheets and we can go through graphs and that's great, but until we find a common um, ability to message with people and say that we're not against them and that we are looking for a brighter future together, then people come to the table and they talk. So. That's the main thing, is to make sure that we can come together as people of Albertans and make these decisions. And if we want to talk about profits, well, what's going on right now is not profitable and won't be profitable in the future. So we need to make a transition. Thank you very much, Jordan. And Brian, it's over to you. You have two minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, how to convince the public of the down that the downsides outweigh the positives uh, obviously, that's a very tough sell. Um, I agree with what Jordan was saying about a number of uh, approaches there. To me, I think it, it, it comes down to being persistent, not letting up, uh, being principled, so that there are, you know, you're demonstrating that there are sound reasons why uh, the, the downsides outweigh the positives. Um, honestly, the, the tech frontier mind it's been going through my mind a lot I thought is there a way that if if all of the uh, negative impacts could be mitigated that a person could say well if all of those conditions were met uh, could it be approved and I remember hearing a, uh, actually a Green Party colleague saying you know if we if we have that reputation that we're just anti everything uh, then we should be able to say if something meets all of these criteria then it should be approved um, and ultimately I'm not sure if I can come up with all of the criteria uh, you know, to, to, that would say the tech frontier mine should be approved. Ultimately, it still would be producing bitumen, it still would be contributing to greenhouse gases. Uh, it's still located less than 30 kilometers away from Wood Buffalo National Park. Um, I do take some guidance from former Premier Peter Lahey though, and uh, I, I don't know if people have seen this article by Andrew Nikifor. Lahey has six principles, hope I'm not gonna run out of time, Act like an owner, collect your fair share, save for a rainy day, add value, go slow, and practice statecraft. Uh, I think all of those could and should have been practiced seconds, leading up to, to where we are now. Uh, and I think that would have led to a situation where the, the tech frontier mine would never have been proposed. Thank you, Brian. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and assembled personages, uh, it's now time for closing statements. And we'll begin in the inverse order of the opening statements, beginning first with Jordan. Three minutes, please. Great. In closing, thanks, guys, for sitting here for so long. If you guys need to do a shakeout, that's okay. I hope you guys are hanging in there. Um, this is great. This has been my first debate um, I've ever done in my entire life. Um, usually I'm up, when I'm speaking on a mic, I'm up performing uh, or I'm facilitating groups and things like this. So this has been really interesting for me. Um, yeah, uh, the opportunities here with Green Party, it's such an honor to be here. And I know that there's been a lot of people who've done a ton of work. And first of all, I want to thank them for all the work they've done to get us to this point. All I'm trying to do is be the spokesperson for that work that's been done and to push us into this new decade. And the excitement that's happening around this party is palatable. And I can feel it, I can taste it. And we're right there, we're on the edge. And I wanna be the person that pushes us over that edge to where we really stand out and where we can continue to grow the party and the membership. And so I think Brian has incredible skills and I think that he's a huge asset to this party, but I'm not sure if he's the one who's gonna go out help these youth movements get rallied. I don't know if he's going to be the one that goes out and says, you know, I'm, I'm gonna lead you because I have the skills to facilitate large groups and I have the skills to make sure that people are inspired and that the messaging is correct. And really, we're just sitting here on this precipice where the messaging just needs to be a little bit more effective for people to understand. And then all of a sudden, you can see in their faces, ah, Okay, you're not just about this. Okay, you are about this. 
okay, now I understand. Because unless they understand who we are and what our values are, then of course they're not going to join our membership. Of course there's not going to be a green wave. And we need to tap into that. We need to be relatable. And so I'm trying to bring something to the table where we can create a real movement here. And it's happening all over the world. And it's time it happens here in Alberta. And so, you know, I've been saying it all this whole day, right here, right now. Well, I'm not looking for three elections later because we don't have time. You know, I've studied, I've studied disasters. I've just studied what's going on. We don't have time for this. We need an MLA in the ledge right away. And by voting for a leader that can rally people in mass scale, which I promise I can do, that's going to be the game changer. That's going to create this big shift. So I've been talking about paradigm shifts. I've been talking about bridging gaps. I've been talking about making transitions that are inclusive with our membership and with people who are not in our membership. Because we need to listen to them just as much. And we need to be able to come together because time is ticking. It's running out. And I'm not going to leave um, my son with the mess that's going on today. I want to do something better. I want to be able to bring people together. And I know that the green values transcend political parties. And I need people to understand the messaging that's coming out of here because Thank you, the world depends on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jordan and Brian. The last three minutes are yours. All right, thanks. Well, um, I have to give my compliments to Jordan. Uh, being up here and doing these kinds of debates are not an easy task. Um, and you conducted yourself admirably. Uh, I want to thank Chris and, and Cass and the other organizers as well. Um, I guess in, in wrapping up on my own behalf, uh, I will uh, confess to you that I may be not uh, very uh, a great at uh, uh, telling about my, my abilities and my skills. I, I tend to be, I guess, on the modest side of things. Uh, but what I do see in myself is that I, I, I rise to a position of spokesmanship. If I'm representing people, uh, that's something where I, I really uh, shine. And so that's something where uh, this role of leader, I think, would, uh, would be a, a dream job for me, if I, if I may say so. Um, my goal, whether I'm elected leader or not, would still be to work for the party and work to, to build up the party um, and to help try and get the good things happening that we need to see happening in the world. Um, I, uh, I can only pledge to do my best with the abilities that I have and work with the people around me that, uh, that uh, complement the abilities. So I try to be working as a team. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, that draws uh, the formal part of the proceedings to an end. Uh, please give our two outstanding leadership candidates a show of appreciation for their efforts today. Thank you for your uh, patience with yours truly. Uh, I'd now like to hand uh, things back over to our exceptional Green Party of Alberta President, Cass Romain. Thank you, Chris. Thank you again, everyone, um, to our candidates for your participation, uh, to our moderator and volunteers, and to each and every one of you for attending the Green Party of Alberta Leadership Debate here in Edmonton. Our next debate, as Chris, Chris mentioned, will be held in Calgary on Sunday, March 15th at 2 p.m. in the Dave Marshall Room of the Inglewood Community Association Hall, with the leadership convention itself to be held Saturday, March 28th, beginning at 9 p.m. or 9 a.m at the Radisson Hotel in Red Deer. Please keep in mind, in order to be eligible to vote online or in person, you must become a member or renew your membership by February 26, and RSVP if you have planned to attend the convention. One last quick ask before you leave. If you haven't already, could you please sign Elizabeth May's petition in support of the Wet'suwet'en, uh, located at the, on the table between the door and the water station? Um, we would all appreciate that very much. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Mm.